Imagine this is Sarah, your neighbor. She's 72 years old. She doesn't really talk to anybody, doesn't really leave the house, and watches TV all day. What would you do to help her? You might do nothing. You might take her out to lunch once a week. But what if I told you Sarah is actually a seven-year-old who doesn't really leave the house, doesn't really talk to anybody, and watches TV all day? Well, you might be wondering, why is she not in school? Why is she not learning more? Why is she not interacting with teachers and peers? There's a big difference in how we think about what children learn and how, what uh, adults learn. And this difference is something that I've been really interested in for the last 15 years. I first encountered this difference when I wanted to learn how to paint. And I was pretty terrible. I didn't really understand perspective and everything looked flat. And people would tell me, you're pretty terrible. Don't quit your day job, you're wasting your time. So I got myself some teachers. I spent three hours a week at the easel and I got all the resources I needed. And over time, my painting started looking more like this. And then people would say, oh, you've got an artistic gene. You, maybe you're related to some artist you didn't know about. So they attributed all the effort that I had put in into some kind of talent, an innate talent. Same thing happened when I wanted to learn how to play the piano and sing. People would say, you're, you sound pretty terrible. Stop wasting your time. You are tone deaf. And I got myself some teachers. I spent time practicing and I got all the resources I needed. And I got better, and then people would say, oh, you've got a musical gene you didn't know about this whole time. The same thing happened when I wanted to learn German. And I wanted to learn German because I married a German guy, and I didn't want secret languages between my husband and my in-laws. <laughs> so I got myself some teachers, and I thought, let's try this out again. I got, uh, I got better, but people would say, you're too old to be learning languages. That's for infants and children. You're, you're way past your period of you know, learning for that. But I got better and now I'm more like a um, two or three year old talking, which I think is okay. And I understand most of what my in-laws say. So all of the skills that I've been learning so far, I gave myself the benefits that infants and children get when they learn. So when I was learning these skills, I had an open mind. I didn't dismiss anything because I thought it was just not necessary to learn. I had really, really good instructors and I had all the resources I needed. I believed in my ability to learn and to improve, and I uh, allowed myself to make as many mistakes as I needed to make to learn what I needed to learn. I also committed to the learning. I learned a lot of these skills many years ago, and I continue to learn these skills today. And I also learned multiple skills at the same time. So if you think about children who learn five subjects at school, they can draw connections between the different subjects to make the whole learning experience much more powerful. So all of these benefits that we provide infants and children when they learn, we actually don't give these to adults when they learn. So the normal learning environment for adults includes very few resources, very little time to learn, not forgiving mistakes, and you know, not, getting, it just, not getting enough help to learn. If we give that kind of environment to infants and children, we actually call that deprivation. So what's normal for one end of the lifespan is actually deprivation for the other end of the lifespan. So what if the deprived learning environment that we're, pri that we're providing older adults and adults in general to learn is actually causing some of the cognitive decline that we see? Asked another way, what can, can giving the enriched and learning environment that we give to infants and children, if we give that to old adults, especially older adults, can that increase their cognitive abilities? So we wanted to test this idea, and so we brought in some older adults to see if they would work with us and, and, and test this idea out with us. First, we brought in a small group to see if it was even feasible to do this study, and then we scaled it up to a larger group once we figured out it was feasible to do. So in the first study, we had six people come in to learn new skills with us, and they took some cognitive tests uh, to see how they would improve in their cognitive abilities over time. And then we had nine people in a no contact control condition who didn't, do the, didn't learn the skills with us, but took the tests at the same period to see if they would increase in their cognitive abilities. And then we had 27 people in the second study 
to learn new skills with us. And then they came in before the intervention started to take the test uh, twice to see if they could just improve just from taking the test. And the skills that I learned included painting and drawing, Spanish, how to use an iPad, um, music composition, photography. And all of these skills are relatively challenging. They, you can't plateau in them within a week or so. And the, the skills were assigned to the participants based on how little they knew about them. So if they knew very little about painting, for example, then you know, never held a paintbrush or something, then they would be assigned to that skill. So they had to learn at least three skills at the same time. And they learned these skills over three months for about 15 hours a week. And so if you think about it, it's a little bit like a part-time job. And if you want to put it in the context of undergraduate education, it's a little bit like taking the undergraduate load for about one quarter. They also had a weekly discussion about motivation, successful aging, barriers to learning, to kind of talk through the issues that they were facing. So the cognitive test that we gave them to track their attention and memory allowed us to see how they might improve over time. So one test that we gave them, for example, had blue dots on the screen, green dots, and blue squares. And they had to count the number of blue dots and then remember that number, see another screen with dots and squares, remember the number of blue dots, and so on and so forth, so that they would have to remember a series of digits. And that's, remembering a series of digits is a little bit like remembering someone's phone number. Another test that we gave them looked something like this, where they would see shapes on a screen, and the top shape had to be sorted with one of the bottom two shapes. And if the instruction was sort by shape, then you would have to put the red rectangle with the yellow rectangle. And if the instruction was sort by color, then you would sort the red rectangle with the red triangle. By sorting like this, you can track how quickly people can switch between different instructions. And so uh, it's a little bit like sorting laundry at home if you have to sort lights versus darks and then sort shirts versus socks. So how did the, our participants do? So from all of the tests that we gave them, we combined their score into a combined cognitive score. And that's what you see on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, you see time. So the, the different time periods, intervention start, intervention end, and then up to the one year follow-up. If you're about 72 years of age, average older adult, you, and you take the test one time, you would land about where that purple dotted line is. If you're an average middle-aged adult, 42 years of age, you would land about where that green dotted line is. If you're an undergraduate at UCR, you would land about where that pink dotted line is. So the difference between the pink dotted line and that purple dotted line is about 50 years. So that's the range that we're talking about. So how did our participants do? Well, so the gray, dot, the gray line here is the control group. They came in to just do the test and didn't learn the new skills with us and they hovered around where the older adult average line is. The first group of, the small group of older adults that came in to learn the new skills with us reached levels that were a little bit closer to middle-aged adults during the intervention. Then the larger group of older adults now reached the levels of middle-aged adults, but you might think, well, hey, they started a little bit higher. That's because they came in to do the tests before the intervention started one time, and then if you take the test multiple times, you can increase because you're, you have a general sense of how the test should go. But they increased to middle-aged adults by the, end of the, or by the uh, midpoint of the intervention. How did they do one year after the end of the intervention? They continued increasing all the way up to undergraduate, young adult levels, that, undergraduates that took the test for the first time. So within a year and a half, they were able to achieve the same levels as undergraduates coming in and doing the tests for the first time. So this is pretty amazing to us, but actually what seems to be more amazing is the fact that they improved in the skills that they learned. And I just wanna show you one example. So here is a painting from somebody from the painting class. This is somebody who hated the painting class, very much hated the painting class, especially at the beginning and you know, never took up a paintbrush, could barely draw a stick figure, wanted to quit basically because she was assigned to the painting class. But over time, the paintings got better. And by this point, towards the end of the intervention, this participant was getting commissions for their paintings. And people were you know, willing to paint for her, uh, pay for her paintings. And these are paintings from other participants towards the end of the intervention 
to show you how much they had improved from the beginning. And here's a quote from one of the participants to, that actually, I think accurately captures what all the participants were thinking in the intervention. So this participant says, I had hoped to get a class in gourmet cooking, not Spanish iPad, and certainly not painting. I no longer have to find one of my grandkids to help me with posting pictures or looking up something on my phone. This study has given me so much confidence in myself and my abilities. It has made me feel like I have a purpose, like I could add something to the world, like my life was evolving even at this age. I feel important and valuable. Before I kind of believed I was a has-been, basically just passing the time waiting to meet my maker. I plan on painting as long as I can afford the paint and canvases, which at this point I may choose to not buy food in order to buy paint. So you might be thinking, well, if learning new skills can have such a powerful impact on people, what should I be learning, right? Well, there are, there are skills that you have to learn as the world changes and as you experience personal changes so that you can adapt to those changes. Those things that you need to learn should be on your list. There might also be skills that you want to learn and those can also be on your list because why not have fun? You might be thinking, how should I learn? Well, all of the benefits that we give to infants and children when they learn to help them succeed in their learning, those can be applied to older adults, especially older adults. So having an open mind, finding good instructors and resources, believing in your ability to learn and improve, forgiving mistakes, committing to learning and learning multiple new skills at the same time. So remember to Keep learning as much as you can, especially if you're an undergraduate right now. Your learning opportunities are going to decrease dramatically after the last year of formal education. But try to find resources, try to find the teachers, and try to keep giving yourself the benefits that infants and children get to learn as much as you need to learn. Reject negative stereotypes that adults can't learn and adults can't learn as, as well as children, so why bother? and encourage people of all ages to be able to continue learning in whatever way you can. So I hope I've convinced you that learning is an important privilege. It's important because we need to learn to be able to adapt to the changing environment and personal changes. But it's also a privilege because it's very, very intensive and you need so much support to be able to learn all the things that we need to learn. So if we can optimize the learning environment for adults, we could potentially mitigate or even prevent cognitive decline. And we can enhance the, um, the online learning platforms and community centers that we have. And we can build new uh, learning opportunities for people and provide learning resources so people don't have to decide between buying food and buying paint. If we can optimize a learning environment for both younger and older Sarahs across the world, we might be able to achieve much more than we think. Thank you for listening. <laughs>